Formerly a Warder for Kit Guru, Core i9 Extreme Edition is here. To give it its full model code, that's Core i9-7980XE, which is a horrible mouthful. The important point is 18 cores, 36 threads, compared to AMD Threadripper 1950X, which is 16 cores, 32 threads. 18 is bigger than 16, 36 is bigger than 32. Better, right? Let's just do a quick uh, test. This is Cinebench R15 running at stock clocks. And Threadripper previously ran just under 3,000 marks. Uh, this is going to be more. It's going to be faster. And look at the hooning away. HW monitor, all those cores and threads loaded up. And the finished. And that is 3,333. It's run 3,300 any number of times at stock clocks. Reliable as a watch. And you will note, cooled by a 240mm Ace Tech cooler, nothing particularly special. I'll go over the specs of the system and so on and so forth in a bit. So there we have it. 18 is better than 16, job done. The fact that this processor costs $2,000 rather than $1,000 for Threadripper, well, that's just money, what the heck. Uh, review over, I think we can agree. Or perhaps we should go into a little more detail. The story behind Core i9 Extreme Edition is fairly well known, but it still bears some repeating to put some context on this review. So uh, AMD announced uh, 1920X, 1950X Threadrippers, 12 and 16 cores. Intel clearly had its next Extreme Edition uh, lined up with uh, Skylake technology, and that was going to be 10 or possibly, depending on who you believe, 12 cores. And there was a good reason for that core count. And then AMD announced the up to 16 cores. Intel responded, bang, here we have the 18 core processor. It might appear like a work of a miraculous uh, engineering feat that Intel was able to come up with this processor so quickly as they were clearly responding on the hoof to Threadripper. But the fact is, at a certain level, it was quite straightforward. And I don't wish to belittle uh, Intel's engineering in any way, shape or form. Because Intel has, once you get beyond the quad-core desktop stuff, when you get to the Xeon territory, they've got three lots of silicon going on. LCC is low core count. That's arranged in a block of three before. So 12, take off two for memory controllers, 10, up to 10 CPU cores. That's your Core i9-7900X right there. Then you have high core count, which is arranged in a block of four by five, which is 20. Take off two for memory controller. That's 18. That's your 18 right there. Uh, bringing out 12, 14, 16, 18 processors is relatively speaking straightforward because they are, when all said and done, repurposed Xeons. Uh, there is a Xeon in the range. It's the E52697 V4. Now that's previous generation. That's Broadwell technology. But in terms of spec, it's very similar to this processor. Uh, if they were to update that to a V5 Skylake, you've pretty much got this processor here give or take. And Intel then has a further trick, uh, which is the uh, extreme core count, which is arranged in a block of 5 by 6, 30, take off 2 for memory controllers, up to 28 cores. The highest core count Xeon in the listing, which is horribly expensive, is 28 cores. That's extreme core count. So this is our first uh, foray into high core count silicon on the desktop. That um, E5 uh, 2697 Xeon, by the by, has a list price of 2700 US dollars. This is uh, 1999 US dollars. So uh, in the great scheme of things, similar. The point is that this desktop processor, while it looks horribly expensive, is actually, believe it or not, discounted from Xeon territory. Not that anyone pays retail price for Xeons. You know, your Dells and so on do not pay list price for Xeons. Anyway, we knew a lot about this processor before it came out. So it uses X299. It's got quad channel DDDR4. It's the same socket as uh, the Core i7s, Core i9s already seen. We knew the base clock speed was 2.6 gigahertz. We knew the maximum turbo boost was it's going to be 4.2 or 4.4. Bit of fudging going on there because Turbo Boost 2 is 4.2 gigahertz. Turbo Boost 3 is 4.4 gigahertz on two cores. What we didn't know was what on earth was going to happen between 2.6 and 4.4 gigahertz, which is a colossal range and makes all the difference in the world. Threadripper, as we know, is up around 3.6. You can overclock it to about 4. We wanted this process to run around 4 gigahertz, which seemed like a colossal ask. When you consider the heat and power problems that uh, well, any number of Intel processors have had in recent times with that uh, thermal interface material, Tim, uh, it really seemed unlikely they could do a proper job with this processor. And yet the fact is they've done a bang up good job, uh, just truly epic, because the all-core turbo speed is 3.4 gigahertz, 
as soon as you put any workload on the thing, 2.6, forget about that, you're up to 3.4. That was the figure we didn't previously have. And the funny thing is that Intel didn't actually send a press kit with this processor, it's just a bare processor in a box. It was only actually running benchmarks so you could see what the processor was doing. The Turbo Boost 2 and 3 figures are actually a bit uh, dubious uh, because Motherboard manufacturers very often turn off Turbo Boost 3 by default in the BIOS. Uh, identifying which cores are going to work particularly well is not uh, straightforward. And the Turbo Boost 2 figure is so close to the uh, Turbo Boost 3 figure, what the heck, 4.2, 4.4. If you're overclocking, uh, you'll be on that territory anyway. So there was some fudging going on there. But that uh, all-core Turbo 3.4 figure, that was really surprising to see. The thing was overclocking. This is uh, currently running at stock figures, but when I overclock it, it will happily run at 4.6 gigahertz. And every piece of software I ran was stable at 4.6, with the exception of Adobe Premiere. For some reason, that was only happy when I pulled it back to 4.2 on all cores, and it was good as gold. Uh, the software simply wouldn't run at 4.6 or 4.5. And when I was at 4.4, 4.3, I could open a project and it would just freeze. Uh, 4.2 is stable. Quite clearly, for doing proper work on a system like this, stability is absolutely key. Let's take a quick tour of the hardware I'm using to review this processor. So we have the Core i9, as already mentioned. The cooler on it is a Fractal Design Celsius S24, which uh, I've previously reviewed. It's an Ace Tech 240. 40 mil. It's the uh, latest 6th gen technology. We've got 32 gig of uh, G-Skill Trident Z DDR4 3200 megahertz memory. Uh, again, that's featured in Kit Guru many, many times. Stable as a rock. Very good news. The motherboard, ASRock X299 Tai Chi. Graphics card is an EVGA GTX uh, 1080 Ti. It's a founder's edition, so it's just a reference thing with some EVGA branding on it. And then the power supply, which is really key to this review, is Seasonic Prime Titanium 1000 watts. Uh, I've used Seasonic Prime Titanium in many of my system builds, and I typically use 650 or 750 watt. For this one, I put out the shout, give me your biggest, and it's the 1000 watt. They do actually have a uh, lesser rated uh, platinum 1200 watt, but for this, I wanted the 1000 to see how I got on with it, and it's been absolutely flawless, and it's powered the system, which uh, during overclocking, is uh, quite some load. At stock clocks, uh, it, it's managed that any trouble whatsoever. Under heavy load, uh, it pulled through like a champ. And then we have uh, a Samsung SSD uh, just uh, to store the Windows 10 hour applications. So as systems go, it's quite straightforward. There's nothing particularly fancy, but it's all good stuff. The big question is, how well does Core i9 Extreme Edition overclock? The answer is surprisingly well. I've made a couple of changes to the configuration. So the Fractal Design Ace Tech Cooler is now running in uh, PWM mode rather than auto mode, so the fans are kicked up a certain amount. And I've added this Noctua fan here, which is blowing air down onto the CPU area in the VRM cooler. Uh, if you had a case fan in your PC at the rear, as you'd expect to have, the fan's doing much the same job, although this is blowing air down rather than drawing it through. The point is airflow, uh, nothing too dramatic certainly not in my mind cheating. Other than that, and I'll show you how I did the overclock in just a moment, we're good to go. Now the 1950X Threadripper, it ran uh, Cinebench just under 3000 in stock clocks, 3400 overclocked. Uh, you've seen this processor run at 3300 in stock clock. The question is, it only has to do another 100 points. How well will it go in Cinebench overclocked to 4.6 gigahertz? Let's see. Temperatures down there, it will flash up because it only uh, polls temperatures every so often. It will flash up momentarily and we're done. And the figure is 4,400 and a little bit. Absolutely massive. Far and away the highest Cinebench score ever. So there's obviously some overclocking guru work going on in here, isn't there? Let's have a look and see what I did. How exactly do you overclock an 18 core processor from stock clocks to 4.6 gigahertz? The answer is, embarrassingly, surprisingly easily. So this is the ASRock X299 Tai Chi motherboard. I'm running a publicly available uh, BetaBias 1.60A. Took that off their website. I contacted ASRock to find out if this is the correct bias for this uh, processor, to which they said, as far as we're aware, there's any person using that processor on this motherboard. Good luck, let us know how it goes. So uh, here we go. So we're in the BIOS, you go to OC Tweaker, you go down to CPU configuration, and you go from auto, to all core, 
you go down to the multiplier, which is currently 26 for the base clock, and you go to 46. You escape out of that, you go to voltage configuration, which you will now notice is on fixed mode 2.1 in red, which is a bit terrifying. Change that to auto, F10, save. That's it, that's all the overclocking I did. And the hysterical thing is that when I actually tried manual voltage settings and such like, the thing refused to boot. Leave it on auto, it handled it nicely. Stock clocks, the voltage ID is the tiniest fraction over one, one zero zero one volts. Uh, when I'm absolutely maxing the thing out at uh, 4.6, it's 1.2 volts. And as you go along each 100 megahertz along the way, the voltage goes up very slightly. And that will now uh, post. And there we have it, booted 4.6 gigahertz, two stages to overclocking. To wrap this up, I've got a couple of questions to answer. What do I think of the Core i9-7980 Extreme Edition? Should you buy the processor? For that matter, who should buy this processor? What do I think of it? I'm deeply impressed. It fulfills its first function, which is to beat the 16-core Threadripper, albeit it beats it by having more cores, 18 versus 16, you're looking at 10-12% uh, better performance, job done. But that obviously only applies if you're talking about highly threaded workloads. When you're playing games and such like, it makes absolutely no difference. But then Threadripper makes absolutely no sense to gamers. For that matter, the 10-core Core i9 makes no uh, sense. Uh, for that, you can do a 6-core is absolutely adequate, and frankly, quad-core is, uh, is plenty. That's why Ryzen 7 is doing so well, because it's overkill and it's relatively cheap. Uh, relatively in this context being around the £400 mark. Uh, so this is not a game changer of a processor to the regular gamer for certain. It's not really relevant to the man in the street. Uh, is it relevant to workstation users? That's a good question. I'm not absolutely certain because the thing is PCI Express is still limited to 44 lanes and that's one of the regions where Threadripper really leaps ahead, 64 lanes. You can put in multiple graphics cards, multiple storage devices, Threadripper will handle just about anything you can imagine. This you have to start making decisions. Do I want two graphics cards plus some stuff, one graphics card plus loads of stuff, do I want 10 gigabit ethernet, what do I want to do? Uh, and the answer is not anything that you want. And when you're paying £2,000 for a processor the answer should be anything that you want. So in that respect, I'm not completely sure about it. I am quite sure the likes of 8-pack is going to update his uh, Orion X system, and that's going to go, is it 16 grand at the moment? So he'll stick in an 18 core, call it something else, uh, rework it slightly, and it'll become 18 or 20,000 pounds. In that context, it doesn't matter how much this processor costs, it's the most. If you're in the market for a, pro uh, a PC that is just hugely expensive, you'll pay a bit more, no problem at all. And the same is true in the next DDR4 kit comes out, you know, 256 gigabytes or some such. That market will always want the most. So there is a market for this processor, it's not necessarily where you think it should be. In the event I was offered a free choice of a 16-core Threadripper and motherboard or the 18-core Intel and motherboard, no money involved whatsoever, I'd take the Intel. That's just a fact. If I actually had to pay the cash money, I probably, well, I wouldn't want to pay the thousand pounds, just under thousand pounds in the UK uh, for uh, the Threadripper in the first place. So the idea of doubling, painful, very, very painful. What does now make complete sense to me is the iMac Pro that Apple has announced. They've announced three models uh, and the up two model is the 18 core with Vega graphics. Uh, AMD graphics and um, Final Cut Pro video editing software obviously work together fantastically well from our, what we've seen of the uh, RX 580. So Vega is going to be fascinating to see. Add in 18 core processor. Wow. I don't know what cooling they're going to use in that or what speeds it's going to run at. And that's a big deal as well. But potentially that uh, iMac Pro is going to be just a monster. Speeds. This is where this processor has really impressed me. The all-core turbo speed is good. The fact you can overclock the thing by a colossal amount, albeit when you start pushing towards the, the final stages, that the heat and power do get really kind of out of hand. But uh, if you pull back on that a tad, instead of 4.6 gigahertz, call it 4.4, 4, 
you've got massive amounts of performance. I, I will be fascinated to see what happens when the first person delids this processor and we see if it's just Tim in there or something a bit more clever because the power heat figures and the clock speeds from this processor were completely beyond my expectations. It's done far, far better than I ever expected. Uh, it really has blown me away. So what's going on inside that core, uh, that uh, package, we will find out sooner rather than later and I really look forward to seeing that. Uh, to summarise, should you buy this processor? No, of course not, but you're never in the market anyway. Were you in the market for a 10 core? I doubt it. How many people are? Very few. Does it achieve its function of uh, beating uh, the AMD Threadripper? Yes, it does. But at stock clocks, only by a very small amount. Overclocked, on the other hand, wow. Just wow. I'm Leo Walder for Kit Guru. If you like this video, thumbs up. If you don't, thumbs down. If you want more from Kit Guru, click to subscribe. This is Intel Core i9-7980 Extreme Edition.